assistant minister on the first day of child month. But I don't know if you know, today is also being observed internationally as World Laughter Day. And so my first piece of advice to my beloved Reverend Anne is not to take herself too seriously. So let me begin my encouragement by sharing some humorous wisdom that came out of the mouths of babes and sucklings. A little boy was heard praying, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a real good time as I am. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's the same little boy who opened the big old family Bible with fascination. He was looking at all the pages and the, you know, the illuminated script, you know, in awe, just trying to decipher all this, all this stuff. And out of it fell a leaf which his great grandmother had pressed. And he said, Mom, she was in the kitchen making brownies. You would never guess what I found. She said, what did you find, dear? She said, Adam's suit. <laughs> it wasn't a very large leaf. <laughs> and I'm not sure if it's the same little boy. No, I think to be politically correct, I should, and for gender equality, before I get into trouble, I better give one about a little girl. Mm -hmm. A Sunday school teacher at Melvin Aunt Lilith asked her children one day as they were on their way over to the Sunday school, and why is it necessary to be quiet in church? One bright little girl replied, because people are sleeping. <laughs> I'm sure it couldn't have been one of my encouragements. <laughs> this morning, my encouragement is titled, The Healing Power of Joy. Many of you may know the story of a man named Norman Cousins, who checked himself out of hospital where he had been diagnosed with a serious disease of the connective tissue. He checked into a hotel room where he watched reel after reel of funny movies and laughed himself back to health. Lots of people know that story. What you may not know and what is really amazing about Cousin's experience is that he found he had to retrain himself to approach life with joy and laughter. Like most people, Cousin's habit was to respond to illness, serious illness, with soberness, fair, and resignation. This is the socially correct thing to do. Note, we refer to it as serious. In fact, in some circles, laughter would be paramount to blasphemy. It, is, it would be seen as unfeeling, ignoring the seriousness of the situation, denying reality, unbefitting of the nature of the disease, and that's why we speak of serious disease in hushed and reverent tones. But in order to change, Cousins had to step outside of the social expectation, the social norm that had been his heritage. He started paying attention to what generated life in him rather than to what seemed appropriate from society's perspective. He's a man after my own heart. And this turned out to be laughter and more laughter. And more laughter released more life in him and he was healed. And so I highly recommend laughing. The ancient Greeks classified humans as laughing animals. And at the boarding school I attended, a particularly humorless teacher gave me three strokes of his cane one day because my friends and myself were having a giggle at his expense. And he said, Scott, is there any difference between you and a jackass? <laughs> yes, sir, I replied saucily. The fundamental difference between myself and a jackass is that donkeys, and teachers I thought, only bray, but I can laugh. <laughs> His face was thunderous. Nobody spoke to masters in that tone of voice. I think I've told you that I may be the only student at Jamaica College who had punishment in credit. That is true. <laughs> One day, a particular teacher walked into the classroom and rapped my knuckles with his ruler. I said, what have I done now, sir? 
he had a thick lisp, his name was Jippy Jappa Johnson, and he said, it's not what you have done, Scott, it's what you're going to do. <laughs> if you have ever ventured to tell a joke to your dog or your cat, you will, find, you will understand that though they feel happiness, I don't think they really have a sense of humor. Um, eh, Carol? <laughs> not dogs. <laughs> she had an encounter with dogs not long ago. They take everything quite literally. They have no notion of double meaning, clever plays on words, incongruity, absurdity, or tongue-in-cheek humor. Now, if you're an animal lover, you know that they have a sense of play, though, but no sense of playing with their existence or with reality as such, I don't know. Sometimes I really wonder. Nor do they have the capacity to stand back from themselves and their circumstances enough to develop a sense of humor or a perception of the comical. Lion and tiger cubs can be very playful. And it is thought by animal behaviorists that this is how they learn their life skills. In fact, it's evidently how most young animals learn their life skills by playing. So I don't know why I got flogged for playing when I was a young, a young tyke. Young monkeys, likewise, can be quite inquisitive and frolicsome, although old monkeys become totally serious, all business and no nonsense. We humans, on the other hand, have a capacity for playfulness that can be just as alive at age 90 as at age nine. One of my favorite Golden Girls actress, Betty White, at, at 93, may not be quite as agile on stage as she was in her 20s and 30s, but her imagination, the twinkle in her eye, the playfulness and humor are just as vibrant and lively as ever. Author Conrad Hires once said, and I quote, the person who is still able to wink can turn the entire universe upside down. Everybody wink. There you go, we just upsided down the universe. <laughs> Friends, laughter can literally revive the life force within us. The truth is that in the apparently most abysmal existence is nestled a potential for pure joy. In the heart of each of us, the presence of life waits to be nurtured and celebrated. This is not just a hope, it is a reality. And if we judge only by the barren conditions portrayed by the news media, we will take life too seriously. It is when we actually grasp the reality of life's powerful working presence in the midst of our challenges that a kind of holy paradox breaks upon us. Yes, the challenge may be there, but so is the healing life. Such incongruity is at the heart of humor, and we allow ourselves to break into laughter as life does its healing work for us. This is a moment and a feeling when you're in having a good belly laugh, it's a feeling and a moment like no other. Am I right? Yes. It is a moment that happened to the biblical characters, Abraham and Sarah, who I think discovered they were, they were to have a child when they were 100 years old. This is no laughing matter. <laughs> no wonder they named the child the Hebrew word for laughter, Isaac. Sarah said, and I quote, God has made laughter for me. Genesis 21, verse 6. This is the incredible moment when the desert begins to bloom, when a healing idea takes hold in our consciousness, and when, God, and when God's laughter within us restores the years the locusts have eaten. It is a time when God's ever-present love, unseen but powerfully felt, begins to work in our troubled minds and our concerns and renews and transforms us mentally, emotionally, and physically. So if you hear Reverend Anna and I laughing hysterically in the office, it may be that we are trying to cheer ourselves up. <laughs> Usually after we've counted the collection. <laughs> Genuine laughter is spontaneous. It rolls out of us, sweeping before it our reluctance, 
making irrelevant our decorum and propriety. Like love, it cannot be demanded. No government can legislate it. No leader can decree it. It is unrehearsed as it flows from us. And perhaps that is why we enjoy it so. Such spontaneity is rare for far too many of us. And down inside our laughter is the knowledge that life can be lived because we want to, not because we have to. One of our teenagers told me once that I am the only pastor she knows who has a sense of humor. I don't know how many pastors she knows, but I hope I will always give my ministry a light touch. I don't know why religion has to be so gloomy. Somehow it goes, it, it's got into the race belief that if you are to be holy and pious, you have to have a long face and be somber and, you know, just be, 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 be very serious about everything. But my friends, life at its loveliest is not a sermon, it's a song. A song that we sing with friends. It's not a funeral march, it's a tune for us to dance with those we love. Too much religion has been like that of the old Scottish preacher whom a young girl asked if it would be all right for her to take a walk in the woods on Good Friday after she attended church. The preacher thought about it for a long while, and then he said, yes, I think it will be all right, just so you do not enjoy it. <laughs> Charles Fillmore, the founder of Unity, once said, and I quote, when joy is put back into religion, there will be more religion in the world, unquote. I'm thankful that religious science is a happy religion. It is not a sin to be happy, my friends, and to laugh. I believe that it is one of the gifts we have as a spiritual movement to offer the world. People are tired of religion that tells them to be spiritual, they have to be gloomy and frightened. It doesn't make sense. Jesus taught that God is a loving father, and what kind of loving father or parent would want to keep us frightened and unhappy? God sees us from the viewpoint of immortality. And I love to imagine his gentle laughter within me when I stub my toe on the obstacles that I myself have created. Listen within, and you may hear the laughter of God. And if you join in that laughter, you will find in it the joy of living. The prolific New Thought writer, the late Walter C. Lanyon, in his book, The Laughter of God, writes, and I quote, and I heard the laughter of God in the soul of my very being, ringing in glorious cadence throughout my universe, causing me suddenly to burst into a glorious laughter which was full of praise, full of wonderful, of wonderful amazement at that which I had missed through looking through a glass darkly. Arise, shine, for your light has come, Isaiah 60 verse one. Do you hear? It is wonderful, it is wonderful, it is wonderful. Heaven and earth are full of thee. Sin, sickness, and death have vanished away." Unquote. So this brings me to your assignment. Are you in for sin, sickness, and death to vanish away? Then you are in the right place. Your assignment should you decide to undertake it, is to look for the humorous side of things this week and to place your mouth in the smile position at least three times a day. Every day this week, place your mouth in the smile position at least three times. It has been proven that just by placing your mouth in the smile position, your body begins to secrete the hormones that make you feel good. Can you imagine walking into your, your, your boss's office saying, <laughs> Morning, boss. <laughs> he, be wonder, he or she will be wondering, now what are you coming up with? So look in the mirror and make your lips smile, and then affirm everything necessary to the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy is mine now. I'll repeat it again for you. And then say, I am wonderful. I am wonderful. I am wonderful. 
So let's have a little practice. Place your lips in the smile position right now. Cheryl, smile. <laughs> Christine, smile. There you go. Maestro, smile. You're so happy. Ah, ha, ha, lovely. Now say after me, everything necessary, everything necessary. to the full and complete expression of the most boundless experience of joy, is mine now. I am wonderful. I am wonderful. I am wonderful. Let me see the body language. I am wonderful. Wow. Let us make joyous laughter a part of our daily spiritual diet. The beautiful Jesus said, and I quote, Blessed are you that weep now, for you shall laugh. Luke 6, verse 21. And so, my friends, in the words of Lanyon, I hear the laughter of God ringing in the deep recesses of your soul. I see the moving finger writing across all the worries and fears of your life. It writes the word, it does not matter. And I see this laughter writing the things of beauty over the walls of our temple, over the cities of the world. I see it in Baltimore. I see it in Kathmandu. I see it in rural Jamaica. I see it in every home and every heart on hilltop and in valley, from east to west, from north to south, above, below, and within the consciousness of the human race the laughter of God, filling our souls with its beauty, its love, its non-judgmental acceptance of all. Truly, you are wonderful. You are wonderful. You are wonderful! Namaste. Yes.